Welcome to America's Top Rebbitons. May this class be for Rafu Shalema, for Miriam Badanita, Raphael Chaim Mayer Ben Sima Hasia, Daniel Ben Luda, and Svi Arye Ben Necha Zissel. Please click on the subscribe button to subscribe to us on the America's Top Rebbitons YouTube page, or click follow to follow us on your podcasting app so that you're the first to know when an inspiring new episode is posted. I am so honored to have on today's show, Rebbitson Mina Eisenbach. Rebbitson Mina and her husband, Rabbi Joseph Eisenbach, are the co-directors of the Chabad Lubavitch of Northwest Connecticut, which is located in Litchfield, Connecticut. So I want to share something interesting about Chabad. The word Chabad is actually an acronym. Chokma Bina Dat. H for Chokma, B for Bina, and D, D for Dat, Chabad. <laughs> so, um, and that's what it means. Understanding, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Chokma means wisdom, Bina means understanding, and Dat means knowledge. So I I recently just learned that. I didn't know that the word Chabad was an acronym, but it is. Um, and as co-director of the Chabad of Northwestern Connecticut, Rebetzin Mina helps to run the Chabad Hebrew School, where each Jewish child is welcome, regardless of their affiliation, religious observance, or prior knowledge. And she also hosts holiday programs, women's learning groups, and a Chabad Women's Book Club. Thank you so much for being here. Please tell us more about yourself and what you do. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. And um, it was so nice to have you pop into Shul a few weeks ago. Thank you. Um, we love visitors because we're a small town, Connecticut. We have a lot of um, New York weekenders who live near us. Um, and our, um, I want to say like what we do in is not a, a typical Chabad house where like we have all these different programs going. It's very much focused on the individual. We live in a very rural area. Um, for example, Fridays, my husband spends at the farmer's market selling challahs, um, not because he needs to make a few dollars from the challahs, but more just to meet people and the people who will never come to shul. Um, right. And that's that's pretty much what we're there for. We're there for whatever we're needed in, you know, not only a religious perspective but in anything that somebody might need and it's been a huge um growing stretching experience for me personally and uh, rewarding in in what way i love that i love it because i mean i was as you mentioned i was at the habat house recently and small like it's not like you have you're drawing a huge population each week like some other habat houses it's really really small it is very small and i would want to say that shul is not like our big thing because there are many people who will not even step foot into shul um, it's more just about the relationships with people and they know that we're there and every once in a while we get like a beautiful, you know, experience or wake up moment. For example, one Shabbos we were sitting in Shul at our Kiddush having a little discussion and a woman walks in, um, turns out she's Jewish, her husband's not Jewish, and she said, can I just go into the sanctuary for a few minutes? I'm going to be burying my mother this afternoon and I just need somebody somewhere spiritual. And she stayed there for, did her own thing, you know, and nobody was in the show. And then she came to the kiddush room and it was like an hour long discussion on the Jewish soul and what happens after life and how to grieve properly. And, and it was just such a beautiful, like, I don't know if I'll see this woman again. I don't, you know, but it was just, I was there. We were there for her at that particular moment when she needed us. Um, That's so beautiful. Yeah. And so, you know, this is actually perfect because today, for today, we're going to be talking about something that's at the core essence of each person, as you mentioned, the neshama, the Jewish soul. And every single neshama, every single Jewish soul has infinite value and importance. We all have our own unique gifts and our own mission in this world that no one else can do, just us, specifically us. And each one of us is incredibly valuable and very, very much needed in this world. So I wanted to start off by talking about what a neshama really is. Can you please explain the concept of the neshama? So basically a neshama literally is, it's in Hebrew, it's chilek alaka mimal, which means it's a piece, mamish, a piece of God. We each have a piece of God within us and with, we know we're created in the divine image. I, I kind of want to, so the soul enters at birth, part of the soul comes and then at a boy, for a boy at his bris and for a girl at her Jewish, um, when she gets her Jewish name at the Torah, that's when like the second stage of the neshama comes in. And then the third stage happens at bar bas mitzvah. And then the soul is complete. Um, and I kind of want to say it's like, you know, a, a very, very wealthy man who has everything. He's got four houses with everything you can imagine. Doesn't lack for anything. It doesn't need anything. But ultimately is, is missing the experiences of a poor man who doesn't have a lot and is struggling, to, but he has a rich family life and, and, and meaningful relationships with people. And almost like that's the way I view it with Hashem. Hashem 
um, created us, it says Hashem created this world as like a, a taiva, which is like a desire. Hashem just created this. He doesn't need this world for anything. He can do everything without us. He doesn't need us for anything. But he created this world with little pieces of, of him running around, you know, with little pieces of him inside our bodies and kind of wants to watch and see what happens and ultimately hopes that when we we're put to the test, we choose the good. Um, and we all struggle. We all have, you know, we fall down, we get up and keep going. Um, so none of us is perfect, but Hashem doesn't want us perfect. You know, he doesn't want us all living in the desert where he's providing for all our material needs. And it's all just a spiritual cocoon. He sent us to go conquer the land of Israel and work the land and bring godliness into the, the low part of the world, the physical part of the world where we all are today. We're all working, living in, you know, in wherever we live all over the world, spread out. And we each do, you know, we bring godliness into good business ethics whenever we meet somebody it could be a smile you know to somebody who looks like they need it you know just all our random encounters we have to bring godliness into that and that's what gives Hashem the ultimate pleasure I love that I, I just love that you touched up on that it's interesting that we have like we're human we're human being obviously but we have a piece of God within us that just struck me when you said that like Yes, we're human, we're not God, but we have a piece of God within us, which makes us more elevated human beings, I feel like, you know, we're, we're elevated. And you were talking about bringing godliness into the world as part of our mission. Everybody, each Jew has a mission of bringing godliness into the world. Can you just like expand a little bit about that? I mean, yes, um, you gave the example of, of giving a smile to somebody who who needs a smile to cheer up somebody who, who might be down. But can you like maybe talk to us about how how like just like the average person can bring godliness into the world? Um, well, first of all, like, I kind of want to like not answer that exactly, but kind of veer off. Like if we look at, at Yiddishkeit, every, I, mean, I assume that and just a cute note about your title, uh, America's Top Rebbitson, which I don't know if I qualify, I've resisted the title Rebbitson for so long because I always felt that kind of created a barrier between people. And now as I'm getting a little bit older, I realize people are actually looking for Rebbitson type of people in their lives. Yes. Um, but no one really calls me Rebbitson anymore, except for my uh, non-Jewish Korean neighbor, who is a, close to a Messianic congregation and knows more about the Torah portion than most uh, people who come into Shul. But um, another cute thing about Rebbitson is there's a, a female rabbi who vacations near us in the summer. And every time they come to show, her husband comes to me. He's like, us Rebbitsons have to stick together. So that's my my co-Rebbitson. But anyway. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's very cute. Um, so I feel like with, with, and I feel like part of this is like my perception shift, maybe, you know, we know that as we grow, we learn and it's always learning. And even though I grew up being, you know, a religious Jew all my life, I feel like I've had some aha moments that we, and part of it is why the special, the uniqueness of each neshama and why Hashem needs us, even though he is that millionaire who doesn't need anything. Um, I used to view Yiddishkeit as like so amazing because with everything that we do, instead of looking at it as like a whole bunch of rules, like you're going to tell me how I have to wash my hands and in what order I have to put my shoes on, like down to the last, what order I cut my nails, down to the last minute detail, there's like a rule about it, there's a law about it. And I used to look at it as like, no, I'm not looking at it as a whole set of laws that I have to follow in order to do what God wants. But more as in with the way I get dressed, I bring God into my life with the way I wash my hands or, or eat my food with saying a blessing before and saying a blessing afterwards. I bring God into my life because I'm seeking a relationship with him. And um, a few years ago, I and this I don't know why it touched me. Maybe it was where I was holding in my life, but I was listening to uh talk on the Torah portion. And I don't remember all the details, but the message was just like life changing for me. And it was a, a story, uh, I think Rashi brought down a story about, it was a mashal, a parable, about a princess who was dying, and before she died, she called in her children, and she kept telling her children not to neglect their father after she passed away, make sure he had his meals. And then another um, commentator brought down the same story and changed a few of the key details. Uh, it was very lengthy, but the end of it was how this was compared to the... Um, sacrifices, the daily sacrifices that the Jews brought at, during the temple. The, the morning and evening one was every day without fail. And now we have, we don't have the, the temple anymore, anymore. So we do davening, we have our prayers. And the way it was described was Hashem needs 
our prayers. He needs us to reach out to him every morning and every e afternoon, every evening. This is a need that Hashem has from us. And so it's not just my seeking my closeness with Hashem. Hashem is seeking closeness with me, with wow. little me, like I'm nobody, you know, like there's so many more uh, scholarly people, holy people, pious people. Why does Hashem want me? And I think that that was just like, wow, you know, this is a two-way relationship. And, and then this um, Shabbos and Shul, we, you know, go around and everybody says, I read something really interesting that kind of touches on this point. It was about prayer. Why do we bother praying to Hashem? You know, we pray for this one to get better. We pray for our, our, our fortune to change, our, for our livelihood, for whatever we pray for. Everybody prays for different things. You know, aside from the praise aspect of praising Hashem, we also request things from Hashem. If we know that the outcome is good and everything Hashem does is for the good, and we're only seeing our tiny little puzzle piece, why we why we pray? Like, what are we trying to change? Whatever Hashem does is good. And they said there was a lot of different, you know, answers to that. But one answer that I saw that was so like just touched on this point was Hashem wants to hear our perspective. What does it look like from our point of view? And I feel like this is again, Hashem is seeking us out. Um, he wants the input from me, from you, from everybody, and not, not only wants it, but like, it's a need that he has, and nobody else can do this for him. You know, it, his millions of dollars, you know, like that millionaire can't buy it for him. Right. So for me, that was like, that really like transformed my view of, of you know, our purpose in this world and our relationship with Hashem. And I love that you're saying like it's a two-way street. It's not just us going to him, praising him and thanking him at, and asking for him, you know, asking for things for him. It's he needs us. He he I mean, he doesn't listen, he like he's a millionaire. He's um complete. He doesn't actually need anything from us, but he wants that connection. Yes. He wants that from us. And when we pray, you know, it's so interesting because I'm actually taking a class in in Hitbo Dudut now. Hitbo Dudut is personal prayer, you know, uh, how to pray to Hashem in your own words versus praying from from a sitter, from a from a prayer book. And it's very, very powerful. And I just want to say, you know, to anybody who's listening, this might just be helpful. And I'm speaking from my perspective now, from my personal point of view. When I speak to Hashem in my own words, I get insights and enlightenment and just information about things that I would never have gotten if I hadn't done the prayers. It's very Eye opening, just like when you're that two way relationship. This is what's making me think of it. You know, like when you're having a conversation with with somebody, you say something, they say something. It's a back and forth. It's an exchange of information. So it's the same thing when you daven. Um, it, it, I mean, from the sitter, also from the prayer book. But I'm speaking specifically from from about a hippo to do about personal prayer. When you're speaking to Hashem in your own words, and you're telling him. Like, I, I need help with my financial situation. I need help with my health. I need help with my marriage. My kid is, I'm having problems with my kid. You know, what, when you're expressing yourself to him and just pouring out your heart to him and just not leaving any stone unturned and just completely bearing yourself, bearing your soul, bearing your heart to him, he responds. He legitimately responds. No, it's not with words. Nobody's going to come down and actually physically talk to you. But he sends you signs and he sends you sends you answers and he gives you clarity on those things with which you struggle with. So I just I just wanted to bring that up um, as to your point that it's a two way it's a two way relationship. I think it's so. And the special. answers are not necessarily a solution to the problem that you're right. looking for, but it's a, a response. Exactly. That's right. He's not going to just say yes. Here's a million dollars or whatever you want. You know. Yes, a hundred percent. So I also, um, I mean, I, I also know that you strongly believe in the value of a single neshama, every single neshama, which is what we were talking about. Every Jew, Jewish soul is special and precious. And while I totally agree with you 100%, I know there are many people listening to this podcast and they're wondering, they're really wondering, why am I so special? Am I really precious? Does the world really, really need me? You know, some people are just so depressed and so down. The world is upside down. People lost their jobs. They're losing loved ones. Things happen in people's lives where they're completely despondent and depressed. And they're just like, oh, you know, did God give up on me? Should I give up on him? And I just want to see maybe you could offer some words of hizek, you know, to, to these people. Can you please tell us why every single neshama is so important and so valuable and why you should never give up on your relationship with Hashem? I don't know if I could solve, uh, you know, worldwide depression. <laughs> um, but if you look at the neshama all being part of one, it's like one body. And you think about a body and like, what's the most important thing that comes to your mind, the brain, the heart. But let's say you stub your pinky toe 
I mean, the whole entire body is going to feel that. So true. And if you flip it the other way around, you know, the head can't go anywhere without the feet. The feet have to carry the head. You know, we, we need every single part of the body. We're all one. So first of all, we need each other. Yes. And everybody contributes something. You know, not everybody has the same talents, personality, but everybody is necessary. You know, I love the example of like the menorah. It was forged out of one piece of gold, but there were seven candles and they're all going up. You know, you with your brains and your Torah knowledge and you with your, you know, um, compassion and everybody with it, we, we need all of it. We're all one piece of gold. We're all one unit. And so we all belong to each other. So first of all, if that offers anybody any comfort. Um, yes. But I think that Hashem does need all of us. Why does Hashem insist that we all dive in and shul? You just said, you know, you are learning how to dive in in your own words, but there's a value to all of us being together. There's so, so much of Judaism has this com com community component to it. Yes, for sure. Um, so I think, you know, and I don't know if everybody's seen this, this little uh, meme going around, but like your birthday is the day Hashem decided the world couldn't exist without you. I saw that one, yeah. I love that. You know, it's like, yeah. it, it just... Hashem does need each of us. We're here. And the fact that we are here and not finished, you know, we have something else that we need to do or to give. And that is the easiest, the best way to feel your, your use, you know, by trying to see somebody who can benefit from you and your talents. Um, you know, I don't know if that's gonna like, but if, if some of some little piece of that will resonate with somebody who's struggling, you know, yeah. we're all, we're all beautiful. Even if, even if, things are not working out for you right now there's you know you're valuable to somebody and you might not always know that and you might not you might never know that or you might find out like in 30 years like we had you know being in a small town sometimes I wonder like oh you know I don't have this like big bustling Chabad house you know where you come you know you feel like you thrive on the success clearly right right and then uh, two years ago in COVID we got a phone call um from a guy who's grown up now but apparently he came to our house for a Shabbos meal when he was a little boy with his mother, who I know who his mother is vaguely. I don't know her very well. I don't recall them ever coming to our house. Um, and he said he played on the floor with my kids. That's what he remembers from the Friday night dinner. And he'd never experienced anything like that before. And something in that night just sparked something within him. And he went on his own path to learn more and went to yeshiva. And now he's fully observant and about to get married. And I was like, wow, I was just like, I don't even recall this. And and I don't take any credit for it. I wasn't there for his question seeking or learning. I wasn't there for the whole journey. Um, so I was meant to be in Litchfield 25 years ago and, you know, hosting him, his family for Shabbos dinner. And, you know, that was just so special to me. You know, it was just maybe just like a little sign from Hashem, like here, you're doing something good, you know, keep going. I love that. I'm so glad that you shared the story. This is such a powerful story. I think this like this answers that with the question to like to a T. This is such perfection because you did something you didn't even know that you did it. You were just being you. Just it, it was Friday night. You had guests. You offered them food, companionship, Torah. You know, just what you do, and just your simple actions of you being you had such a profound effect on this person that you had and you had no idea and you only found out like how many decades later. You know. And, and I think it's it's so for all of us. We're we're in the world. Like I always tell my daughter, Hashem, Hashem woke you up this morning. You're breathing. You got up this morning. It's 6 30 a.m. The alarm went off. You're up. That means you're needed. That means Hashem needs you. You know, not everybody has that privilege to get up in the morning. And it's true, you know. True. Yeah, this so is like a random a random story. My husband was um yeah. walking home and he saw somebody who was like sweating profusely and clearly not feeling well. And he offered him a ride and he gave him a ride. And then he just casually said, have you seen your cardiologist lately? Whatever. A few months later, he called my husband and says, I have to thank you for saving my life. I went to see my cardiologist and I don't know exactly the details, but like, you know, it was just like a comment that my husband made in passing, you know? So you never know anything, any little, you know, thing that you don't know what you do, even if it's just a good morning or a smile to somebody you passed by on the street. Right, exactly. You don't know how your actions are going to affect somebody, even if they don't affect them the next day or the day after. It could have a long lasting effect that could be traced back to what you said or did. Right. You know, originally. It's amazing. It really, really is. And I also want to say something before I forget to, to the effect that we're all one. I really loved your analogy to the menorah. The more menorah is one, it's one solid piece. It's one thing with the with the candles going up. You know, you would never cut off your arm 
you know, to spite your other arm, you know, because it's all, you know, it's all part of you. If you cut off your left arm, your entire body is going to feel it. You know, if you, you can't cut off your left arm to punish your right arm because it affects the whole body. So just as, you know, if we hurt another person, it affects us as well. I always like to say your success is my success. And when you're struggling with something, I'm struggling with it too. You know what I mean? Because we're all one. That's why we all have to try to help each other when we see somebody else is down. Just like your husband, he saw somebody struggling in the street. It wasn't him struggling. He was driving the car. He was totally fine. But he saw somebody else struggling and he stopped to help. And it eventually ended up that he saved this guy's life indirectly, but he did because he stopped to help. And the same thing, if somebody else gets uh, has a success, if they get money or they get a job or their kid gets into a great school or something positive and happy happens for them, that's your success too, even though that you didn't cause it, you didn't have anything to do with it. But because you're one, all of your actions affect each other. It's not just you, it's other people too. Yes. It's so beautiful. Um, and you know, it's so interesting because I also want to bring up something very important that you had mentioned to me in the email. So many of us have multiple children, two, three, four, six, eight, but you have 13 children, which is such a huge blessing. And I know that you very, very much believe that in every family, even maybe especially in a large family with so many children, each and every child is a blessing and no one gets lost in the shuffle. So I want to see if you can please share with us your perspective about having a large family and how you view each child as a blessing. Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I just want to say I'm very much influenced by the teaching of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, even though I, I think I don't realize how much of it comes from the Rebbe. And I was just like, I just thought this way, or or it's kind of like by osmosis, you know, I almost, right. um, so the Rebbe always spoke so strongly about each child as a blessing, and, and it brings blessing to the home, and somebody came to the Rebbe and said, was listing all his problems, you know, um, he, that he, his business, he couldn't make money, whatever, and he was just telling the Rebbe a whole list of things, it's been in such a bad year, and the Rebbe said, wait a minute, didn't you have a new baby this year? How could it be a bad year? Meaning the fact that you have a new baby brought such blessings, the entire year is transformed in a new life, you know, a new life. And the par parenting is, um, I was the oldest of a large family, kind of thought I knew a lot about, uh, but then nothing kind of prepares you for being a mother yourself. It's definitely the most challenging um, yeah. and most rewarding yeah. and and the, I used the term stretching before this like really stretches you out of every comfort zone you've ever known. Yeah. Um, but I also kind of like to say, it's like, where else do you feel like, you know, you light a Shabbos candle, you do a mitzvah, you don't always feel like the rewards imminently, but when you are raising children and there are, I feel like you get the rewards sometimes like here in this world, like you don't have to wait for, you know, when Hashem does, after you pass away and Hashem does a whole record, you know, of all your actions over the years, you kind of get a little bit of the reward here. And, and um, maybe because it's so hard, that's why Hashem gives us a little bit, you know, when you give your your cute kid, when they finally said something nice and you give them a big hug and a kiss and like you're that, that, that moment is like your reward here and now, here and now, um, probably it's what keeps us going also. Um, also, I feel like for my kids, I, I am their only mother. Right. There is nobody else who like, maybe their second grade teacher is not such a wonderful teacher, but the third grade teacher is, you know, they'll get another chance. Um, so, and I, in a way, like, of course I gave my all to, you know, there, there's no getting around it, waking up at night and feeding babies and all that. But as my kids get older and they keep coming back to me, I think that's more, um, indicative of our relationship and they come back to me for advice and for checking things over and it makes me feel like they know that I'm here for them no matter what you know so it's so special yeah that that for me it's like when they get I, I'm not a baby person I don't uh I don't <laughs> I, I have to admit I don't like being pregnant I don't love babies you know I kind of wait till they get a little I like the interactive stage kind of like Hashem you know he likes to the two-way relationship yeah. Um, I appreciate the kids when they're, when they're older. Um, so, I, you know, it's, I can't say this is like a natural thing, like, oh, I'm just going to have as many children as I can. It just, Hashem blessed me and I, I, and, and gave me the tools. I hope he did the tools to deal with the, whatever I needed to take care of my children. Right. And you bring up a good point because I was going to ask you, I mean, 13 children, that's, that's 
that's all that's a lot of kids but people still i mean it's a challenge even if you have three four five six kids it's still a challenge you know to manage to maintain so i want to see if if you're able to share with us as a mother of 13 just even some of the tools that you learned in the hopes of helping other moms who are in the thick of it and like they're with their children and you know they may be struggling oh well the one comment i dislike is when people think like oh you're just i'm not like you and like, you might not be like me, but I'm just like you. I struggled when I had two kids. I struggled when I had three kids. And unlike my neighbor who came to me before I was expecting, you know, one of the later kids, she's she's like, oh, Minna, you have your freezer stocked with all your meals for afterwards. And I was just like, I can barely breathe. No, I haven't prepared any meals for afterwards. If my family has to have macaroni and cheese for a few nights, it's okay. You know, um, I just don't assume that because I have a large family, I'm running my house like an, like an army general and we're ship shape. And in a way, um, I think that's helped me a little bit because when you try to be so like in control, it definitely helps. I, I whoever has all those coping, give give all the workshops and get all the tool, you know, that definitely helps. But in a way, the letting go, um, you know, ideally I am the kind of person that would like my towels in, in size order, you know, and but I of course I had to let go of a lot of that. Um and that has helped me deal with things like for example I, I when my number seven eight nine and ten are all boys and I wasn't a new mother but I kind of like was like oh my gosh what happened here we have this like male energy just like bouncing off the walls and I just couldn't um quite it was it was difficult um so in the beginning when I had children and if somebody would spill a cup of orange juice I was like oh my gosh I spilled the orange I have to wipe it up and now it's like I can tell you that the orange juice is going to spill I I see it happening and we'll just deal with it afterwards, you know, and that happened out of necessity, just because like amount of energy I had didn't grow with my family. And maybe it got depleted a little bit, but my perspective changed. And I think that's what helped me deal with a lot of the, the chaos, you know. That's actually a really powerful tool. It's a great tool. Try not to like, when you hold on so tight that you ended up, you end up exploding because it's really out of your control. When you're a mom, you have to, well, you have to de-stress and you have to let it go. And also it changes the energy in the home. When you have a mom who's not so uptight and so stressed, you have a more relaxed environment and the children feel more comfortable. And it's just, it promotes a positive energy and it's okay. You'll clean up the spill. You'll put away the towels. You'll get the toys. You know, if the kids go to bed a couple of minutes later, it's not a big deal. It's more, it's more about cultivating the relationships and just cultivating a, a happy, stress-free, as stress-free as possible. I'm not going to say it's stress-free, but right. as, as calm as possible of an environment. Right. It's focusing on the, you know, the how the clean, tidy house is is I love it. It's definitely best for me and my mental health, but it's right. not of prime importance. My my kids is more important. And very well put kids spill something because they had a mistake, you know, like why why am I making them feel bad about it? And and my the older me probably would have, you know, not been so understanding, you know. Right. So it's yes, yeah, so it's a good tip that you learned. I think thank you so much for sharing that. That was actually really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, and I do have one last question. I know that we touched about it on it before, but um, I know that your Chabad house, the Chabad of Northwest Connecticut, is one of the smallest Chabad houses in the world. And I think that being in this position actually allows you to make an even greater impact on your community. I mean, I'm sure that you have seen many families who were previously unaffiliated before Chabad was established now grow into their Judaism. And you know that you've shared a few stories, which I love stories. I think we can all learn from stories. So the more stories, the better. I want to see if you could please share me maybe an, another story or two about some of the families in your community whom you've seen come close to God through their participation in the Chabad activities and programs, or just any, even in any interaction between you and your husband and the Jewish community. So first thing is there's no community. There are Jewish individuals that we've met over the years and maybe we sort of formed our own community, but there was no, you know, where I grew up in West Hartford, it was like, oh, I'm Jewish and I'll introduce you to my Jewish friends. And in Litchfield, it's not like that. It's like, I think that guy might be Jewish. You know? <laughs> it, we assume now that every couple is only one spouse Jewish, which makes things a little challenging sometimes. Oh, interesting. You know, in the beginning, we had some, I guess we just were a little young and not as aware and, you know, all of a sudden realized that somebody who we counted for minion wasn't Jewish just because his wife was Jewish. So now, unless we're told otherwise, we just assume um so that was about community the second thing is the goal is not my goal is not to transform people from irreligious to religious 
my goal is if I inspire somebody one new thought or one new mitzvah, even if it's just a one-time thing, just a positive exposure, you know, I've, I've changed my goals uh, a lot because um, I can't, I, I can, I'm only here to, to offer what I could. I can't make anybody do anything or come to any realization. I have to do all that, that work on their own. Yes. Um, and as I said, sometimes I've struggled, for example, I, I redefined my meaning of success. Um, it was one time during day camp um, and the inspector was there. They, they Connecticut is one of the strictest states for uh, camp inspections. And one of the kids was like bothering me. And I was like talking to the inspector and he was like nudging me. And finally, I'm like, okay, what do, what do you want? You know, he says, what comes after Melech? He was in the middle of washing for bread and he couldn't remember the rest of the bracha. And I'm like, that's amazing. This is a kid whose father's not Jewish. He never had a bris. And he came to our day camp and he wants to know what comes after him. So, so for me, those are wow. like the that means I've made some difference, some impact, you know. Um, because day camp takes your whole your whole life and soul out of you. So yes, I know it's a very hard thing. I know. Right. Wow. Um, so those are like the I've changed myself to not expect anything from anybody and not expect it's it's not about like the packed hall or the big program. The programs are not the main thing. The main thing is just that one person learning one thing, you know. And um I'll tell you one story about a a girl who we knew her stepfather. Uh, do you have time for a story? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. This, my husband went to a federation dinner and a woman was being honored for the Lifetime Achievement Award. And being a very humble woman, she and I never met her. She but apparently she was a wonderful woman. She um hold on one second, talking about all those children. Yes. <laughs> Um, one of, one of my children will join us. So, Great. um, this is Yehudis. Say hello. Hi. She, 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 <laughs> family. Um, so being modest, this woman gets up to accept her award and she says the joke, I, many people have heard it about this man who was the miser of the town and he passed away, but the rabbi was away for some reason. So they called a rabbi from another town to do the funeral. And this guy didn't know the man at all. And he's singing his praises. This man was such a wonderful person or whatever. And the wife of the deceased man nudges her daughter. And she says, open the casket and make sure he's talking about Papa. You know, like it was, mm. it was a very cute uh, story. But unfortunately, she collapsed on the stage and um, she passed away. And my, wow. we learned then that her son lived in Litchfield. And that started off a very nice relationship with her son, who... Um, who had a wife who was not Jewish and three beautiful daughters. And over the years, we've gotten to know him. And then he remarried a Jewish woman. And this Jewish woman's father and first husband was not Jewish. And so this was like a blended family of a man with three non-Jewish girls and this woman with two Jewish kids. And the non-Jewish girls grew up with a lot more Jewish exposure than the two Jewish kids. Anyway, wow. so one of the daughters, the, they, they all came to the Hebrew school and um, one the summer, the mother called up and said, "Can you um, take my, my, my can my daughter?" She came to work in camp as a junior counselor, and she loved it, and it was great. And then she said, "I." She called my husband. She says, "My daughter wants to go to Jewish school. She loved the time with the Chabad girls who were counselors, and I need your help to talk her out of it." So oh, my husband's like, "Yes, yes, for sure." Anyway, she went to a Jewish school for two years, and. Um, it started her own journey and she went to a college and she went to Chabad there and she married a Jewish boy. They're not, um, traditional. They, they do, they do, they're not like a, a fully observant, but they're a Jewish, they a Jewish home. They're raising a Jewish girl, little girl. And, um, when she mm -hmm. got married, um, the rabbi from Chabad and the college campus where she was had to do some research to find out you know, have to go to the room to find out if she was actually Jewish because as a child she would go to church with her father. Wow. So when they finally did the research, they discovered that her great great grandfather was um one of the Hasidim who welcomed the previous Rebbe to Chicago at the turn of the century and, and was on the podium there. So it was just, you know, it was I was not there the entire again, like they was that I was there for that summer camp for the Hebrew school. And then she went on her own journey. And, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, I don't know. It's just, um, 
I offered what I needed to offer her. And then, you know, she she met other Chabad houses along the way. She's very close to the Chabad in her college. You know, so I just, and that was it. It's, I'm just part, I'm just one of those little, like, these people along the journey. It, I mean, it's so beautifully put. I love this story because it really, really goes to underscore the point that what we do matters and what you did matter to the to, to all these people. It really, really mattered, especially to that girl. It's amazing. Really, really amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebetzin Minna, for joining us on America's Top Rebetzins. It was truly a pleasure to have you here with us. And may the learning we did today be for Afua Shalema, for Miriam Bananita, Raphael Haimer Ben Sima Hasya, Daniel Ben Luda, and Svi Arye Ben Nechazisel. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. My and pleasure. I wish you a, 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 a happy new year, a healthy new year. I mean, thank you so much for you too. Thank you.